In March, NATO went to war. Did Milosevic believe we were going to bomb him? Of course he did. Did he believe it would be as severe and sustained as it actually was? That I can't say. It was a war fought in the name of human rights. Yet NATO's determination not to take casualties extended the war and the suffering. It's fair to say that we were not allowed to uh, apply military power in the optimum way. And you never go into a combat situation where you tell the enemy what you're not going to do. Now it's emerging that NATO was secretly planning a land invasion of Kosovo. I'm absolutely sure that NATO would have done whatever it took to be successful in this campaign. Tonight on Four Corners, the main players of the war tell their story for the first time. How Operation Allied Force was won. Tuesday night in the Kosovo capital of Pristina. The NATO peacekeepers from K4 are on reassurance patrol. By the way, please. Corporal Kevin Martin of the Royal Irish Regiment is acting as a social worker. What's my job? Oh, she's afraid. Yeah, of course she is. <laughs> Lubica and Dobritza are in their 80s and they're trembling with fear. Yeah. Albanians have threatened to kill them. The bruise on Lubica's forehead is from a recent confrontation. The lady is saying that they are not against the law. If the law says that they must leave, they will. The law does not say they have to leave. They are free to live here like anybody else. Yes, so free in principle, but not in practice. Intimidation has been systematic. More than half the Serbian residents have fled Kosovo. The war that NATO fought to stop the ethnic cleansing of Albanians has created a new cycle of revenge. Now the Serbs are the main victims, and that's a striking reversal of the power balance in the province these past 10 years. How the Serbs lost Kosovo is a complex story of failed international diplomacy and misjudgments that led to the worst war in Europe in half a century. In March, the U.S. Special Envoy, Richard Holbrook, was sent on a final mission to negotiate with Yugoslavia's President, Slobodan Milosevic. Hello, um, I have a brief statement to make. Uh, President Clinton and Secretary Albright sent our delegation here to Belgrade on a mission of peace at a time of escalating violence in the region. Holbrook persuaded Milosevic to end the Bosnia War in 1995. Now he threatened a new war unless the oppression of the Albanians was stopped. At about 10 in the morning on March 23rd, I went in to see him alone. And we sat alone in this vast room in the White Palace, surrounded by his art. And normally there were other people in the meetings. And I said to him, you understand what will happen when I leave here today if you don't change your position and he said yes you will bomb us and uh, there was a dead silence in the room uh, uncharacteristic and I said I want to be clear with you it will be and I used three words I'd worked out very carefully with the US military it will be swift it will be severe 
it will be sustained. And he said, in a very matter-of-fact way, very flat, no more engagement, no more negotiations, I understand that. You will bomb us. Thirty hours later, we climbed atop of our hotel roof and watched as the first missiles of Operation Allied Force slammed into the outskirts of Belgrade. NATO had planned a short war. I think there's no doubt at all that NATO believed that this would be a very quick military operation. I think two or three days is perhaps uh, a, a little much of an exaggeration, but certainly they thought it would be over in a week. I made a speech in the House of Lords in which I said that bombing would not end it in three days. It would stiffen the Serb resistance and it would cause much more hardship to the Kosovan Albanians if we hadn't done it. The big difference was uh, the estimate of whether it was likely to be a two-day bombing campaign or a two-week bombing campaign. Uh, and the real underlying reason for that was that everybody believed that Bosnia had shown in 1995 that if only you bombed for two weeks, you would have peace. But NATO had miscalculated. Kosovo was more important to most Serbs and certainly to Milosevic than Bosnia. journalists from NATO countries were either expelled or advised to leave, we were able to keep reporting. Now it's time to return. I've been looking forward to this day for some time, going back to Belgrade. Having reported the war there for three months, I'm keen to feel what peace is like in the city and to talk to the government ministers about the war they fought about the genocide in Kosovo, the forcible expulsion of perhaps a million people, and most particularly about the lies that they told the Yugoslav people. Hello, Mr. Ivanovich. How are you? Fine. Very well. Nice to meet you. Pleasure. Jividin Ivanovich is the foreign minister of Yugoslavia. He's an old style socialist. On the day we met, he'd just come from Milosevic's White Palace. And he was as ready as ever to argue the claim that NATO's campaign had breached international law. You could hardly expect a sovereign country, and especially this country with well-known history, to surrender, indeed, uh, uh, with... Uh, and because of threats, because of uh, absolutely uh, unacceptable uh, positions which were not uh, justified by law, by uh, standards, by moral principles, etc. Mr. Ivanovich tries to characterize Yugoslavia as the righteous David up against the Goliath like NATO. The mightiest military organization in one hand, and here you have one very tiny, small country, small people resisting and defending itself. Politically speaking, and political part of, of NATO countries expected basically uh, Milosevic to accept NATO demands after a couple of days of not so serious bombing. And on the other hand, Milosevic here, he thought that uh, after couple of weeks of bombing that uh, European public opinion will go against the NATO and against airstrikes and against the United States. Milosevic hoped the 19-nation alliance would split. After all, Greece, Italy and other countries had never favored going to war. For NATO, maintaining unity would become the overriding challenge. And it would test all of the diplomatic skills of the Alliance's Supreme Commander, General Wesley Clark. From the time we went into this, we had to move from a political dynamic of consensus, compromise, least common denominator solutions, up to a military dynamic that relied on the principles of war. Surprise, mass, concentration, focus on the objective, and so forth. Colonel Pallon, no, sir. the Dutch commanding oh, officer of the Dutch Hello. Hello. Good to see you. From the outset, General Clark was hamstrung by...